Welcome to Piano Inspires podcast, celebrating pianists, teachers, and innovators as they share their inspiring stories about the transformative power of music. Attention all keyboard pedagogy enthusiasts and educators. Do you want to share your insights and expertise with a passionate community? The National Conference for Keyboard Pedagogy is now accepting presentation proposals for our upcoming event. Whether you have an innovative teaching idea, a research project, or a performance technique you're eager to showcase, we want to hear from you. Your presentation could inspire fellow educators and make a lasting impact on the next generation of musicians. For more information and to submit your proposal, visit nckp2025.com. The deadline to submit proposals is Monday, October 21st, 2024. Don't miss this chance to be a part of something extraordinary. Together, let's elevate piano and keyboard pedagogy to new heights. I am Sarah Ernst, Director of Teacher Engagement for the Francis Clark Center. Today's guest is Tim Topham, and I'm just thrilled to have him with us today. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's, it's very my, cool. It's our pleasure. So Tim Topham is an internationally renowned music educator, Australian, piano teacher, writer, podcaster, and presenter. He has more than 20 years of experience in education, having taught in the UK and around Australia in subjects as varied as music, outdoor education, PE, mathematics, and IT. His series was the first in Australia to feature creative practice ideas for improvising, exploring, and composing to help students and teachers feel more comfortable being creative in lessons. His recent publication, No Book Beginners, has given lots of ideas for the field on ways to start students at the very beginning with this idea of creativity and student-centered learning at the heart. Tim holds an MBA in educational leadership, among other credentials. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's very cool to be hanging out, and I'm very inspired that you guys have started a podcast as well. I think it's really, really cool. Yeah, well, the whole heart of it is that we want to know people and where they came from, their inspirations, and especially where they started from. Mm. So, Tim, tell us about your early years in piano. Well, it goes back to... When I was about eight, I started piano lessons and I was connected with um, the teacher who, I, who would become my childhood teacher, uh, Miss Mack. She was a phenomenal teacher. She was kind of traditional when I look back on it in many ways, particularly with like starting reading at the beginning and, and the way she taught that. But the thing I remember is that she always allowed me to learn things that I wanted to learn. Mm. Random things like the Chattanooga Choo Choo, I remember wanting to learn, <laughs> and uh, Take Five and, and pieces like that that were not necessarily on her radar or things that she would normally teach or things that I could actually play very easily. Mm -hmm. But she was committed to always helping me learn things that I wanted to learn and teach me those things. And, and that's something that always stuck with me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I studied with her for it was a relatively short amount of time, maybe five years. I did two grades of music, grade one and grade six. And I left her lessons at about age 14 uh, because I thought that classical music was a bit lame at that stage. <laughs> I was too cool for it, right? <laughs> Early teenager, I'm like, no, I want to do jazz. So, I went right. and studied jazz with another teacher for about three years. And then I didn't do sort of one-on-one -on -one lessons apart from through school. So, I studied at, at school and then I played for school musicals and, you know, did a lot of that mm -hmm. accompanying and band, playing in bands and things like that, that a lot of us do. Uh, and then eventually I did go on to study a uh, bachelor of music. Mm -hmm. From there though, the, the story goes into all those things that you mentioned before, right. a whole lot of different teaching and nothing to do with piano pedagogy at all for many years. So if we can back up to those early years, what's the what drew you to the piano initially? Was it kind of music always in your house or was there something in particular that, you know, made that spark for you? Uh, it was sparked, I think, my, so my, in answer to your question, my family, I've got two older siblings, one of whom was learning piano at the time. My sister and my brother was a trombonist, although, but no, no one was particularly um, 
uh, world-class or, you know, passionate about mm-hmm. it. It's just something that was mm-hmm. done. But there was a lot of music played in our house, mm-hmm. like recordings, mm-hmm. records back mm-hmm. in those days. I kind mm-hmm. of, I remember when dad brought home the first CD player, like yeah. makes me feel really old to say that. But so there was a lot of music in the house, l- listening to music. Um, but the, I think the catalyst was actually this little Casio keyboard I was given, uh, this tiny P1, mm-hmm. PT1 Casio keyboard. And, I think my parents saw that it was more than a, a toy for me, and I was actually being able to, I was actually able to play things that they could recognize and uh, and tunes that I was hearing and things like that. And they're like, mm, well, maybe I mean he does seem kind of interested in it, right? There's so something maybe, there. Yeah, yeah, maybe we should get mm-hmm. him some lessons. Mm-hmm. What what kind of piano student were you, or what what when you were a kid were you really drawn to create music on your own? Did you improvise? Did you, yes. you play by ear? It sounds like a little bit. At yes. Least initially. Yes, I yeah. did. And I was really interested in synthesizers mm-hmm. and electronic music. So my dad listened to a lot of Jean Michel Jarre, who was a, like a godfather, I guess, of electronic mm-hmm. music. And, and so I always wanted keyboards. So that, that little keyboard became a bigger keyboard, became the next keyboard. You know, anything mm-hmm. I could save up for, I would try and buy synthesizers mm-hmm. and on those I would compose and record and they would have sequences on them where mm-hmm. I could record a track and then play that track and mm-hmm. record another one over them and I used to love doing all of that kind of stuff um in my lessons though there was that was much more focused on learning music repertoire exams mm-hmm. and I was I I, re- I wasn't a really good student honestly I, I actually found in, pre- in preparing for this conference, I found a video of me being t- being at playing a recital with Miss Mac when I was 13. And, oh, it's quite embarrassing. It really is quite embarrassing to, lo- to watch From back why, on. Why is that? Oh, just, I was just a, a little bit, uh, what's the word? I was a, I was just a teenage, I don't know how to put it. <laughs> it's like. Ambivalence? No, 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 no. no. Okay. Like I, and I could play, but I didn't really want to. I didn't uh-huh. want to be there. Okay. And I kind of made it known. Like, uh, I was just yeah. a bit rude. And I'm looking back and going, oh. <laughs> and I've got two teenagers at the moment. I'm like, you know, why are you doing this? And I'm like, and there, there is me literally on the camera doing, doing those, that, so those kinds yeah. of things. So, yeah. <laughs> but I, I didn't. I, I never really liked performing. It was not not my thing mm-hmm. at all. I'd much preferred either accompanying and playing along with someone mm-hmm. else or in a band or something, or just making my own music. Well, you know, it's it's a. Re- I think it's a reminder though that you know the students that we have in our studios, we don't know what their trajectory is, right? You know, and I and from what I've read about you and Miss Mac, she also comes back later mm. in your life is mm. very formative, right? And we just never know, you no, know, so that, right. that student that might be an ambivalent 13-year-old might end up being 20, 20 years later a piano teacher. Mm, you never know, true. right? And yeah. it's why I, I also think that when it comes to practice, for example, we all want our students to practice and be successful and make progress. But when students stop practicing for whatever reason, it's really easy, I think, for us teachers to go, well, no, you're not practicing, so, you know, it's too bad. You need to go. Um, and I think it's often in those teenage years, a transition between elementary and high school and things that can be really difficult for all sorts of reasons. Mm-hmm. And practice can drop off in that period. And that's like the, the crucial, most crucial mm-hmm. period when mm-hmm. we have to do everything we can to try and keep them. Yeah. And so adding, fle- you know, just being flexible in regard mm-hmm. to practice expectations and things, particularly during that period, I think can be make the difference between someone that will continue. And we, as you say, we don't know their trajectory, mm-hmm. but if they quit, there's a good chance we do know their trajectory, which is there's not going to be much more. Mm-hmm. So what kinds of things did you find yourself doing in that space between, you know, having the formal lessons and then not having the formal lessons? And you also mentioned the jazz studies. Mm. Like, what was that period like for you? Was it a lot of exploration? Yes, but it was also a lot of not music, actually. Mm. Uh, and I think that's 
part of the reason that I come to have a slightly different view of piano pedagogy mm-hmm. is because I, I did have a real break from it for 15 years-ish when I was out doing more classroom-style teaching and teaching in multiple places and all sorts of different subjects and substitute teaching and just a huge amount of experience that wasn't piano-based. Um, and at the same time, I was still being musical. So I still was accompanying friends who were singing mm-hmm. or I'd play for a wedding or, you know, think mm-hmm. little bits and pieces like mm-hmm. that. And I still play for my own enjoyment, um, but none of no, nothing teaching-wise in the music space. Uh, and I think that's why when I eventually came back to piano teaching many years later that I was able to just kind of draw from all this experience, all the different people I'd met, all the different subjects I'd taught, all the different places I'd been and and the different ways things have done and try and bring that into what I was doing in my lessons. Mm-hmm. So now I'm just curious to know why did you come back? <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good question. I came back because I, well, Truth be told, I so I so after I'd done a lot of this travel and different teaching, I came back to Melbourne, my hometown, and I decided that I wanted to be a dance music producer and remixer, and I thought because I thought that was really cool. So at that stage, I was kind of going to clubs, and I thought, how cool would it be to make mm-hmm. lots of money and becoming a famous DJ, dance music producer? And so I gave myself three years or thereabouts to make a living from it okay. and I very soon realised that that was just not possible and I'd spend 30 hours on a track and make n- no money from it. And I, it was it was a fun time and I had music played on radio and, and in clubs but never made an income from it. So I really, at that stage I was relief teaching, so substitute teaching. Mm-hmm. But I also then went, oh, maybe I could piano teach again mm-hmm. and try it out and it's it's that experience and starting to teach just about anyone I could find mm-hmm. pretty much mm-hmm. as we often do when we mm-hmm. begin that I suddenly started realizing actually I really enjoy this mm-hmm. oh and it's actually paying the bills so mm-hmm. that that's how I got back into it mm-hmm. and that's when Miss Mac came back into my life as well yeah and it sounds like she helped you kind of provide some of the structure for those early lessons mm. so, i mean where what did she provide for you during that time yeah well specifically one of the students i took on was an exam student who was preparing with a previous teacher to take a grade four exam which is you know, relatively um difficult and I'd never put a student through an exam, so I I had no idea what I was doing really. Um, and that's when I when I reconnected with her yeah. and contacted the family members, and we found out where she was, and she she'd long since retired, um, but was only too happy to reconnect with me. And she pretty much just taught me all that she knew and gave mm-hmm. me all her resources and took me through all the different exam pieces, mm-hmm. what to look for and how to teach it and the phrasing and all that. So it was a huge crash course in specifically piano pedagogy, I mm. guess, because I, I already, yes, I had class. I, I'd been mm-hmm. a teacher for many years, so I, I knew how to teach. But the specifics of what makes for good performance, mm-hmm. particularly in an exam mm-hmm. situation, I think that that was some of the crucial stuff that she taught me. Yeah, no, that's interesting because you had so so much teaching experience at that point that I suppose the interaction. And just the structuring of time mm. probably what weren't the things that you needed to think about. It was more nuts and bolts of piano. Very specific. For, very specific. Yes, yeah. yeah. And and I also I hadn't at that stage done uh, a performance degree myself. Mm-hmm. So I hadn't performed at a high level mm-hmm. in a recital and an exam situation. That was to come later on. Uh, and I think without that behind me again, I didn't quite know just specifically what was required for this for high level performance, mm-hmm. um, and and that that was and how to teach that of right. course because right. we all know many people who can perhaps perform something really well mm-hmm. or do a skill really well, but being able to teach it is another thing. So she had lots of great strategies and tips, and tricks about how to 
actually teach this. That was critical. Mm -hmm. So if you think to the time kind of before uh, that you were coming to piano teaching with Miss Mack assisting you, you mentioned that you were kind of in public schools doing a variety of other forms of teaching. Is there anything particularly formative during that time that you feel like really did impact how you approached your lessons? Oh, that's a really good question. I can't think of anything specific. Uh, no, it, it was nothing specific. It was more, I think, about just the way because I would I would be teaching so many different subjects mm -hmm. and organizing large groups of kids on programs and camps and outdoor excursions and things like that, interacting with lots of different people. I did teach some music as well in a few different schools, so I did have that music connection too. But no, short answer is I can't think of anything precise that I can mm -hmm. go, oh, that has really informed how I go about this mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. it, it was really quite a collective experience. And it was also because I had held some leadership positions in schools too. I did a lot of um, training, leadership training and organisational educational training. And I think there's, there's just a lot that I was able to somehow <laughs> mash up in my brain mm -hmm. and be able to bring to what I then well, yeah, I mean, so it sounds like you probably worked with a lot of different age groups, a lot of different settings, mm. a lot of different types of people. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And I would imagine, well, I can imagine that being an, um, a pretty amazing training ground for then a teacher to walk into a variety of lesson sit settings with a wide variety of student base, right? Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I was working with yeah primary school age, mm -hmm. elementary age, as well as high school. Yes. Yeah, it was a... Huge experience in a lot of different areas. Yeah, that's wonderful. So tell me a bit more about um, music for you today. So I know that you've really worked to build a really large community of people who are really passionate about teaching piano. And I wonder how even music and piano playing are part of your life today. That's a good yeah. question. Yeah, I don't get asked that very uh -huh. often. So my, and people listening are going to, they'll either not believe it or laugh, but my own passion for playing music is classical now. Oh. <laughs> it's full, full, <laughs> full circle. circle, right? Absolutely. I don't often sit down and improvise or I don't play jazz. Uh, I, I, will, I will work on Chopin in particular, my favorite mm -hmm. composer by far, and I am still working on a variety of his challenging works, some of his skirtsy and his fantasy and F minor. Oh, that's and wonderful. His yeah. etudes, of course. I, and mm -hmm. I, I, just, I love, I really relish the challenge of just mm -hmm. how long it takes to get good at these things mm -hmm. and then having to have some lessons. So I, I did some online lessons and I, like, I filmed them a year or two ago with Fred Karpov about mm -hmm. some technique. I've done some Taubman work with various people because I just, I just love learning mm -hmm. about about technique and performance and things. So that's that's what I do for my own uh, pleasure. The other thing I love doing is, and it again sounds really kind of lame, but a good old fashioned piano party where friends are over after dinner or whatever uh -huh. and we sing, I play piano and people absolutely love it. And, you know, sing show tunes or 80s songs or whatever it is. Yeah. And I love doing that. That's that's something that really gives me um, it gives me chills just kind of thinking about how much fun it is. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. When you do that, are you do you work from lead sheets or anything, or do you do yes. primarily ear playing? No, no, no. Yeah. I I'll just flip through the music. Um, my sight reading over the, over time has got fairly fairly good uh -huh. in all the schools because I've had to do a lot of accompanying when I have taught music mm -hmm. uh, and accompanying all sorts of different instruments and singers and, and shows and all that kind of stuff. So my accompanying skills are pretty, sorry, my sight reading skills are pretty strong. So I can generally, mm -hmm. which of course is still mind blowing to people who don't learn an instrument. It's like, how, like, how can you actually do that? Mm -hmm. um, and I just, yeah, I just love it because it's, it brings people together. Mm -hmm. It's fun. It's musical. So yeah, that's, that's 
what yeah, I, I love I that. Mm. I love that. It's funny because I think I might be the reverse where I was just really passionate about classical music, but then now in, in this stage of my life, I'm actually trying to expand my creative skills, right? right? So it's interesting, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but uh, I wonder if there are any other particular influences that you feel on yourself right now in your, you know, life as a creative musician and teacher and also kind of leader of a community. Like, what are the real strong influences that you feel? I think my main, more recently, my main influences have been in the business world. Mm -hmm. for helping me create and grow pop music. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the people I've followed have been online marketers mm -hmm. and internet business people who who have really helped me be able to sort of work out how, how on earth do I actually grow this audience mm -hmm. and, and find these people and bring them into my community and support them. Musically, I can't think of any particular influences uh, and I think apart from my um, I had an amazing teacher who who took me through what's called the Associate of Music Australia the AMSA in Australia which is the kind of second top level performance degree that you can get so our exam boards kind of go one to P to eight and then they have these kind of three okay. degrees on top of that mm -hmm. and and she, so she was a huge influence. That was Caroline Almonte, amazing mm -hmm. classical pianist, uh, concert pianist in Melbourne. Um, obviously, Miss Mac in the past. Now, nowadays, not so much. I, I obviously get inspired by watching YouTube performances mm -hmm. of people playing these pieces mm -hmm. that I'm desperate to be able mm -hmm. to play. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I can't, couldn't, couldn't say any in particular yeah. in the musical side. Yeah. I wonder if I could learn more about your experience in this. Uh, it w so I guess it's a formal exam setting that you went through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to know, like, did you prepare a program for that? What was that like? Yeah, it's a 35 to 40 minute recital mm -hmm. with four, four pieces, one from each of the main eras. Mm -hmm. So Baroque, um, classical, romantic, 20th century. And... You, so you, yeah, you put together the program with a teacher, and it it has to be it has to be a, f a fairly impressive recital that's done mm -hmm. solo. You can use music, so it's not one that has to be fully memorized, and it's performed in front of two assessors. Um, and. And, and there's another level higher, which is slightly harder music and a slightly longer program. Mm -hmm. And there's actually one above that, which is like a full concert kind of performance. Mm -hmm. um, and these are the, the, the higher levels. And the other component is that you have to do general, what's called general knowledge, mm -hmm. whereby you just need to know completely in depth about your pieces and their composers, the history, their life history, where this piece comes in their history, mm -hmm. all of those things. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I dreaded having to do that and then really enjoyed learning about the composers and like, because I, I did the Rachmaninoff Elegy in E flat minor and I found out that he wrote it at 19 or something. Mm. And it's like this incredibly <laughs> complex, brooding, dark, romantic piece that you like, you wouldn't think yeah. a 19 year old would even be capable of. And just learning some of that about these composers, I think, in just enabled me to play the pieces even even better with mm -hmm. more depth. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really glad that that is a component of this exam. Mm -hmm. Even though I kind of dreaded it, it was really instructive, really useful and quite powerful. So was that in a written form or an oral form? Yeah, it's or yeah, an oral yeah. form. So once you've done the recital, yeah. they can ask you sort of five to five minutes of questions on anything. Really? Oh, very good. So yeah. I had to know. Don't ask me to go into detail. Yeah, I but, won't. No um, <laughs> I played a Bach, one of his partitas, yeah. and so I had to know all about. And and I already I'd been worded up that one of the examiners was a real Bach 
scholar. Okay. So chances are, I was told, you're going to be asked about the Bach piece. Right. So you get to and know all your what, dance yes. forms. And, yeah, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was, yep. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> so I, in, in your recent book, there's this diagram that shows the iceberg. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so it's interesting to hear, hear you talk about that because you're, you're talking about the top of the iceberg that we see above the water, mm -hmm. right? And so I wonder, you know, you obviously valued that experience, right? Yeah. Right. And um, I know that it also seems that in, in, in what I've read that you also valued, you know, all, well, all those other things underneath the water that mm. you listed there, improvisation, composition, creativity, playing with others, et cetera, right? And so I wonder um, if you could just talk about, you know, that I, it's not a dichotomy, right? It's not like there's exams and then there's all that other mm. things, right? But that they really live together, right, as a whole or should. musician. Yeah, yeah. I, I, but I think I think that can be a dichotomy because mm. it is hard for some teachers who are brought up very traditionally and classically trained to to see the uh, those under the water, as we'll call it, the below the iceberg um, elements or skills as being part of the lesson when they didn't experience it themselves. Yeah as as students um but i and i'm hoping though that it's not as separate and it is becoming more homogenous and i and i believe that is mm -hmm. actually happening um and you're right so my that exam experience I, I think because i did it as an adult and i did it when i was teaching piano already it, it really one of the things it did was give me confidence it, it gave me it made me feel like, oh, okay, actually, I, I can play this instrument. I can play it actually really quite well mm -hmm. and I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, it was a checkbox that I felt I needed because I hadn't done the regular path right. through mm -hmm. the conservatories and, and all of that. So that was, a, that was a big reason for me why that above the iceberg experience, which is exactly what that was, mm -hmm. was important to me. The reason I guess, though, that I... I'm so passionate about the below the iceberg is because so much of what I experienced at school and in my more formative piano playing and the experiences that I had accompanying and musicals and all of those things, so much of that was built on some of the skills that I had around chords, understanding mm -hmm. chords and harmony and being mm -hmm. able to read lead sheets and have a pretty good ear and be able to play by ear. Mm -hmm. I used a lot of that in a lot of those situations, like when you're accompanying or you're uh, playing for auditions and you're just thrown music, like mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons people can sight read really well is because they have a pretty good knowledge of keys and harmony mm -hmm. and they can kind of guess a lot of what's coming up mm -hmm. if they can't read mm -hmm. it in time. The only way we can do that for students is to help them understand that it's not just about the dot to dot, it's about the vertical harmony that's going on in the music. And the more mm -hmm. we can teach them about that, which which to me is that below the waterline mm -hmm. stuff, the more we can unpack that, the better they can read all their music. And, mm -hmm. and if we can explore harmony or chords in the context of a fun composition or improvisation or the pop music that they're mm -hmm. already listening to, then they're going to form stronger connections with that. Mm -hmm. They're going to understand it better and they're going to then be able to apply that to the regular mm -hmm. repertoire that they're learning mm -hmm. in their lessons. So I'm not sure if I answered that question. but No, you, <laughs> no, you, you did absolutely. And it actually um, leads me to another question. So what what is kind of inspiring to you about the kids today, right? You know, and especially if you think, you know, kind of this this holistic form of education where you're really trying to build a musician at the piano who's really learning skills that they can take to a wide variety of contexts. Mm. You know, what do you see from the kids that are learning in that way that makes you go, ah, oh, yes, this is it? I just like that kids uh, aren't letting us do boring stuff anymore. Like... <laughs> Kids, and this goes for classrooms as well. Like yeah. we can't just a classroom teacher can't just teach the same curriculum every year like mm -hmm. they may have done in the past, mm -hmm. be that good or bad. I mean, obviously it's a good thing that they don't they can't do that anymore. The the whole move towards more inquiry-based learning 
and giving students autonomy in what they're doing, which we know from self-determination theory is a really powerful aspect of self-motivation mm-hmm. in education. The more that we can get them involved and help help them achieve things that they want to do, the more that they're going to have agency and, and power in the decision-making and want to do those those things. So I, I like that kids these days want something different, want mm-hmm. something more and aren't content with just the status quo or just, okay, I'm just going to, you know, you, you teacher tell me I'll just go through the standards, you know, we'll start with mm-hmm. Bergmuller and then we'll go to Clementi mm-hmm. and then we'll go to some Beethoven mm-hmm. and, um, you know, and, and, I, and I know for some teachers that will be difficult but I also hope that a lot of teachers will look at that. I won't call it pushback because it's not necessarily pushback, but look at that questioning of, of students and seeing that they maybe want something different and more. And rather than go, I can't, I can't teach you that or what do I do? Go, all right, let's, let's try it. Let's, 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 let's see what yeah. we can do. <laughs> yeah. Cause it, cause it, it's, it's so much t- teachers can get so much value from trying new things that's what Mm i you know for many years i've been sort of anything that i put out i suggest hey i've had a great experience with this here's something you can try and here's the reason why Mm -hmm. i believe it's powerful in in the pedagogical Mm -hmm. sense why don't you give it a shot and i just encourage teachers to try these new things Mm -hmm. because it's it's fun Mm -hmm. and it's going to make them better teachers and students are going to respond to it and i think students also these days quite like actually students have always wanted to see their teachers as humans as fallible mm-hmm. humans and you know back when we were at school you know the the mm-hmm. school master was up on the raised platform mm-hmm. and blackboards and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. and it's just not Mm-mm. what we need or what students want anymore and i think that's good mm-hmm. no that's interesting to hear you say that because i'm right now in a teaching situation where i'm helping some undergrad pianists learn to improvise Right. But improvisation is not something that say, usually is on my earlier. bio, right? Yeah. Right. So it's it, I'm actually the ideal model for that class mm. because I'm someone who's my improvisations they sound pretty good, but I'm not going to scare them away from trying mm. because you know I'm doing it too, right? Yeah. You know, and I think the the students in the class are really responding to it and actually really enjoying. Yeah. Right. Which is wonderful. It's right. re- it's more real yeah. mm-hmm. when they see that you're trying something new yeah. and you're making mistakes and you're okay to go, okay, that didn't quite work. Whoops. Well, let's, <laughs> let's try. I'm learning as well. Yeah. I think it's the best thing for a teacher yeah. to be able to say to a mm-hmm. student, go, you know, I, I've just found out about this cool thing. Can we try it together? Yeah. I want to, I want to get, I'd love to give it a shot. And students will always go for that. Right. Yeah. And, you know, then you, you, you are, you're able to build an environment, right, for that learner, mm. right? Hopefully that then helps them to have a willingness to just go, whoops, you Absolutely. know, you know, yeah. let's you're, try again. You're modeling oh, yeah. effectively. Right. Right. The environment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I, I really, you know, have enjoyed reading about, um, you know, your, your approach that you're um, advocating, mm. right? Um so I wonder if, if you think about, so top music is a community of educators, right? So what, what inspires you from that community? Like what has inspired you to build it? What, what do you, what feeds you from that community? Mm. Well, what inspired me to build it, I think when I look back was a recognition that not everyone has a Miss Mac in their mm-hmm. life mm-hmm. to ask questions of, to get training from and all of those kinds of things and so many of us are so isolated and alone and it's you know it's why i love the nckp the francis clark center mtna like all all of these organizations Mm -hmm. we're all trying to do the same thing which is help teachers who are independently working in their own studios feel more like a part of a group where they can ask questions and not get laughed at or chatted at or anything like that um, and be able to get training and to stay current and to feel supported and to feel a bit more confident, a little bit like that exam gave me that confidence. Mm -hmm. 
I hope that people who come into our community and can ask questions and do some of our training courses can also get that sense of, yeah, one, I'm not alone. Uh, two, I'm, yeah, I am, this is okay. What I'm doing, I'm doing a good job mm -hmm, here mm -hmm. and it's okay that maybe I'm pushing the boundaries a little bit or I'm trying some new things. Um, and so just that confidence I think is, is really important. But I, I, I just love hearing the stories of what the teachers in our community do and try and the buzz that they get from a new experience they mm -hmm. didn't expect. Mm -hmm. And in, in many cases as well, and I talk about this in the book, a lot of these teachers will suddenly realise that they are more creative than they think. Mm -hmm. I think it's really easy for teachers to beat themselves up about I'm not, I'm not very creative. I, I can only, I can read music. I can't improvise and things like that. Um, and I think a lot of the resources that I put out gives them just enough mm -hmm. ideas to go, oh, okay, maybe I can do this. Mm -hmm. And they, they get that little buzz. And then some of them take these ideas, some of the no book beginner ideas, and take them even further than I had ever imagined mm -hmm. and build upon those mm -hmm. ideas with their own creativity. And that's that's a huge win in my books. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how the piano teaching community really has to rely on the community mm. in, a, in, in almost a, a unique way because we're all in our own studios or schools, right? And so we have to have that community across those. Mm. right to expand and learn yeah absolutely and, and share um so what have been some of the major or not even major but challenges or obstacles that you feel that you have faced recently or even in your more distant past that you feel like you were over, able to overcome but that really gave you something moving forward oh that's a good question isn't it um, not one that I'm often asked either, yeah. actually. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, anyone that's tried to build any kind of community will know that it's, it is a lot of hard work mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of time and effort and a lot of perseverance. And I think I've realized to, in some ways, not sweat the small stuff. Mm -hmm. In that you're always going to get pushback and naysayers and people that disagree with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And in some ways I look at that and go, I'm actually kind of okay with it because it means I'm I'm being clear in a new mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. And it's not gonna not everyone's gonna agree with this no book beginners idea. Mm -hmm. Not everyone's gonna agree with um technique not being the first thing you do in the first lesson with a student that has to be perfect. These are just my ideas, um, but I think I've learned over time that if you want to get something new out into the world and you want to build mm -hmm. something, you have to be, you have to understand that that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. People are going to disagree and to not, not let that get you down. No, oh, that's really good advice. Yeah. And it's how you know you're pushing the boundary. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's right. I think I, I read something somewhere that said, if you, if you, don't get pushback or something mm -hmm. to the effect of if there aren't some people who disagree with you, then you're probably not being different enough or clear enough mm -hmm. or some, something, something mm -hmm. like that. I don't mm -hmm. know. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, yeah, I often think about that and I, I, my purpose isn't to upset people by the way as well. I try and always, when I put new things out into the world, make it very clear that mm -hmm. this is, this is, this is what I've created. This is how you can do it. And this is why you might mm -hmm. like to. And here are the outcomes that you're mm -hmm. likely to get. I would love for you to try it. But mm -hmm. it's completely up to you if you want to do that. So how do you see right now in your community, uh, whatever community you'd like to consider, kind of how do you see the impact of music and piano playing? On the students? Yeah, in, on, from any, any level. Kind of where do you see the major impacts right now and what's really exciting you? About music? Yeah, about the future of music. Oh, I, yeah, it's, 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 that's, a, that's a funny question because I instantly think about 
AI when you mentioned yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> aren't we all? <laughs> so so uh-huh. have you, you've seen the new AI. So we all know about ChatGPT, uh-huh. but now there's this new AI film generation mm. software. I can't mm-hmm. remember what it's called, Scrum or Scrub or something, which you can type in a prompt and it will create video, mm-hmm. looks like Pixar, yeah. on, on that topic. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. And so I I think, I mean, there is going to be come a time when music can be created at quite a high level right. by computers. And I don't know what quite what I think about yeah. that yet for film scores and right. all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's that's something that came came comes to my mind, but it's not a it's not necessarily a positive. It's a, I'm not sure right. yet. Right, right, because there's always been this human component to music making. Mm. Always, right? Yeah, music is is right. one of the most human I, things. I isn't know, it? and so when you think of AI creating music, you go, yeah, yeah. Where is the humanity in right. that? Right, yeah. No, I understand. Uh, I, I, but I, I think I, I can't see it affecting the desire for children to want no. to learn instruments. Yeah, there's always going to be kids. And adults, for that matter, who want to learn mm-hmm. to jam, play guitar, rock out in a band on the drums, or whatever mm-hmm. it is, like I just can't, I can't see that changing. So, I think our future is secure in that regard. Yeah. But I do think we will need to keep keep up with with changes and what's going on um, mm-hmm. outside. I think one uh, actually, I'm just coming back. to You asked a question earlier about what what did you take from sort of your previous experience that you can bring to the ped- pedagogical mm-hmm. world? I think one of the things more generally speaking is that I did, I was able to bring experiences from multiple other, not just music, mm-hmm. outside of music and business and information systems and technology and things like that, bring that into my mm-hmm. lessons as well. I think that was another component that I probably should have mentioned earlier on because it makes me think about um, the you know, we can learn a lot, I think, as music teachers from not just being always in our music teaching bubble, mm-hmm. just keeping an open mind to what's going on in design and technology and things like that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm not, not, again, I'm not sure if I fully answered your question. Well, I mean, I think it's on, it, your answer was is what's on a lot of our minds right now. Mm. Right. We're all contending with what does it mean? For our future. Yeah. Right? You know, when, when you can type into chat GPT or whatever app you're using and get full scale, very good definitions and examples and you go, wow. Yeah. yeah. We, we just, yeah. we just have to make sure we are evolving mm-hmm. and adapting our teaching. As we were saying before, to match what our students need and want at the moment. Mm-hmm. And I remember when mm-hmm. ChatGPT first came out, I thought, oh, now this is going to be really interesting to see what schools do with this yeah. because it's going to change what assignments they can give people mm-hmm. to do at home mm-hmm. now. And I assume that's happened. I'm not working in schools anymore, but I assume changes have happened there. And so for, for teachers in their instrumental studios, I think it's just really important to continue to refine and adapt and adjust and try and change and learn just just be ready to explore and expand Mm -hmm. your horizons try new things because i think that's a way that will keep current in our students Mm -hmm. minds and to not be afraid Mm. right you know it's interesting i've heard a lot of teachers say well i'm kind of nervous about that or fearful of Mm. what that means right Mm. about change in general Mm -hmm. well and and also the change of ai right right that means yeah yeah uh, yeah, I, I I don't have an answer at the moment, but I'm cautiously optimistic that we will mm-hmm. will be okay as long as, as I say, that we yeah you know, number one we work together, our communities are strong, we keep supporting each other, mm-hmm. and we keep um, building on our skills mm-hmm. and adapting and adjusting and growing. Last question: How does piano inspire you? Ah, oh, how does it inspire me? Well, look, it puts a smile on my face whenever I have a student uh, and whenever I play. Actually, no, it actually frustrates me more. (laughs) So the question wasn't how does piano frustrate you? (laughs) No, it inspires me because 
of what it can bring out in mm. students and what it brings out in me. And I, I love that if I'm having a, you know, a rough time or I need to get some space, I can actually go mm. and play my instrument. And that's a beautiful thing to be able to do. And mm -hmm. so that's what inspires me. I think it, that the piano can be a getaway and it can be an incredible escape and support for both ourselves and our students. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you, Tim Topham. It's been a delight. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. The Francis Clark Center is a not-for-profit educational organization that serves the advancement of piano teaching, learning, and performing. Divisions include Piano Magazine, Piano Inspires Kids, Journal for Piano Research, National Conference on Keyboard Pedagogy, the New School for Music Study, Piano Education Press, International Online Teacher Education, and Piano Inspires Online Community Hub. Please visit us at pianoinspires.com to learn more about our impactful work and inspiring community.